In this video, I am going to be talking about bugging out or a convoy to survival. Not necessarily a militia task unless you come at it from the angle of you are trying to evacuate family members out of the engagement area, out of the battle area. Now, indications are that if something does start off here in the United States, the globalist forces, foreign forces, whatever you want to call them, they will not just target us, those of us that are committed to being in the fight. They will also target our families. I listened to a uh, radio call in one day on an alternative media website where the person had served in uh, special operations. He was either Delta Force or a uh, Navy SEAL, I don't remember which. He was talking about how they conducted operations in Iraq for going after insurgents. Typically they would raid the place between 1.30 and 3.30 or 4 o'clock because that's the time everyone would be asleep. They would come in and arrest everybody. He said they were trained or told that when they do it in the United States, it's not going to be arresting. They're going to come in during those times and they're going to kill everybody. They're going to kill the potential militiamen. They're going to kill their family members to include kids. And that way, if they lose control in the media, they will spread the story that the militiamen, you know, he was having problems, he was breaking down psychologically and murdered his entire family. And they'll cover up the fact that the entire family was killed in a raid. So that's why we may want to evacuate our family members should something happen and get them to a safe area. Safe areas would probably be in the mountains, in the woods, some type of wilderness type area. And I do accept that here in the United States there's not too many of those left. So that would be something you would want to recon now. Now you're going to have to be able to get those non-combatants, those family members to that location along with additional food and supplies that they will need. So you're going to have to convoy. First off, everyone will have to meet at a rally point. So the militia member will load up his family inside one vehicle or two vehicles, load up the supplies, depending on the amount of time they have, and go to a set rally point. And they'll, be, they'll know that so many people are supposed to meet at that rally point. So they'll know that, say, three or four families are supposed to meet at that location, or they'll meet just one other. Then they'll move on to the next rally point. And then possibly a third rally point. Somewhere along that point, at one of those rally points, they're going to get together, they're going to have a larger convoy, and then move on to the safe area. Now, with the convoys even moving out from the first rally point, you're going to want to set it up where you have a scout out in front with two people. That vehicle should be a smaller vehicle, fairly lightweight, hopefully a four-wheel drive. They should be a mile to two miles ahead of the convoy. They will be watching for obstacles, ambushes, roadblocks of any type in the convoy's path. If they come across it, they radio it back to the convoy. There should be a set radio check back and forth through the entire convoy, like every five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. You don't want to go too long. You don't want to go a half hour. You don't want to go an hour because then there's the possibility your recon element out in front has been taken out and has been a while ago and you don't know it. You think they're still up there. 
or they may have had to turn off and bypass something and you missed that bypass. You missed the turn off. But you're going to want enough distance between the recon element and the convoy that they can react to anything they come across. This lead vehicle should have a minimal amount of supplies, weapons, and fuel on them. Because this vehicle is the one that would most likely be lost in an ambush. Your two people, one person will be a driver, one person will be in charge of the radio, and they'll also be the security person. They should be dressed in civilian clothes regardless to try to blend in with the population. Now back in your convoy, regardless of number of vehicles, you should have at least two that are dedicated to security. One in the front, one at the rear. The one in the front should have the majority of your, your security personnel, say four to six personnel depending on the size of the vehicle. The one in back could have one or two less. In between those security vehicles will be your non-combatants and vehicles carrying cargo or supplies. Now, your front security vehicle should be pretty heavy duty. Something along the lines of a GMC Suburban or a uh, excursion possibly some type of uh, heavy-duty pickup truck, an F-250, F-350, something that's big and beefy. The reason for that is to ram its way through roadblocks because it's always a possibility that the security element will go past and an ambush will then, you know, push a car out of the bushes across the roadway to try to stop the convoy that's coming up. Well, if you see something get rolled across the roadway right in front of you, these guys need to stomp on the gas, hit it, push it out of the way, and then everyone needs to haul ass out of the kill zone as fast as they can. You don't want to stop in a convoy unless you have to, unless it's a planned stop. Because whenever you stop, your chances of being ambushed go up considerably. So always keep that in mind. Now, for duty positions inside the vehicle, the driver needs to only concentrate on driving. Okay? They, a person, cannot help you by checking out the sides, looking for ambushes and stuff. That's what the people that are in the passenger side and the people in back have to do. With your cargo vehicles or not combat combatant vehicles more than likely there's not going to be anyone in there with a weapon or if there is a weapon in there it'll probably be with the driver if there are older children say teenage years and stuff and they can handle weapons they are reliable for it they can assist with having the window open on their side their rifle barrel sticking out if the situation calls for it if the situation has not deteriorated to the point where that's needed, then the weapons need to be kept inside out of sight. Now, with young children, uh, one thing that came up in a discussion in my unit at least, if a vehicle comes under fire, younger kids, toddlers and babies, they're not going to be able to fight, not going to be able to help out. So one thing we talked about is possibly using larger sets of body armor and putting it around the kids, especially if it's a kid in a car seat, especially if it's a baby. Get a larger set of body armor, an extra large, a double XL, whatever you can get. Put it around the kids to protect them from incoming fire, but make sure that they can still breathe and stuff. Now, if all you have, you're convoying out it's a family, you have a husband and a wife, and you have two vehicles. The lead vehicle will do the same as in the larger convoy. He will travel in front one to two miles. This more than likely would be the husband. He will also have a radio to communicate with his wife and family behind him. 
he will let them know if he comes across anything so that they can react ac accordingly. If there are any older children that can handle weapons, they should be back here with the family or possibly driving the vehicle and the mother pulling the security with a weapon for if need be. Now, if a vehicle gets knocked out because you came into an ambush, what will happen is the next vehicle in line that's able to, if we're taking fire from this side, this vehicle's knocked out, this one will then come in, put the disabled vehicle between them and the ambush, use this as cover. Then they will use the doors on this side to get out the casualties into that vehicle. While that's going on, another vehicle will be providing fire, putting fire onto the ambushers to allow the transfer to happen. Priority is getting out the people, especially children. Get them out, get them into the other vehicle. After that, priorities are radio equipment, maps and overlays, weapons, and then personal gear, and first aid kits. But really, as you're pulling people out of this vehicle, they should be grabbing that stuff as they're coming out, okay? If they're able to hold stuff, they're able to grab weapons, they're able to grab the maps and all that stuff, they do it. So that you're cutting off one step less time inside that kill zone. And then you get the hell out of there. Before you begin the convoy, you need to make sure everyone has the exact same map, the same overlays. They know what the primary route is, what the secondaries, what the tertiary routes are. And you need to have marked on the map where the bypass is for each you know, length along the roadway. So that you know if you come across a roadblock at this site because you came across 10 vehicles that crashed together and they burst into flames. Well, you know, you may have to back up, say, one mile, take the, the turn off to the right. You'll travel cross country for about three miles to this country road, get on that country road, travel so many miles ahead, and then you'll take a left turn at this location to get back on your main route to continue on or you'll continue on that uh, secondary route. Convoying is not that hard, it's just very nerve-wracking and when you put in there the possibility of non-combatants, especially children, you know, your, your tension levels will go through the roof. I've heard that there's a lot of talk now that's being put out from quote unquote survival experts where they say you need to have the lightest vehicle as possible so that you can travel faster to get around. Well, problem is a lighter vehicle is not going to be able to push their way through a barricade. Uh, I suggest you check up on the Jessica Lynch incident in Iraq in 2003. That maintenance company was ambushed. Uh, reportedly, they came across roadblocks that if they had gone through any of those roadblocks, they would have gotten out of the kill zone easily. None of them had the common sense to use the larger trucks that were with them, because they would have had trucks based on five tons, to ram those roadblocks to get through the kill zone, to get out of there. Because they had the mentality from the civilian world of avoiding accidents. And that can get you killed in a combat situation or a Rawl situation or a Teowaki situation. Now, for all my engineer brothers in the Patriot and Militia Movement, always remember, SA.